brought to you by people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there is a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us today for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. You know the kind of freedom that people want when they talk about political freedom and we want to be you know, the, home, the land of the free and the home of the brave? They're talking about freedom to do whatever they want to do, whenever they want to do it, any way they want to do it. And that's not freedom. That's not the Romans 6 freedom. That's not the freedom of the Bible. Just to go out and do anything you want to do any way you want to do it and whenever you want to do it. That's not freedom. And if you don't know that, you don't know enough to discuss it. We're the Lord's free men. And Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 7 in the context where, where if you're a slave in a cell, you can still be freer than a guy walking the streets with money in his pocket. There's a spiritual freedom. Well, I say that so that you understand when people want to use the Bible for political means and to promote their liberal political causes or their conservative political causes, they always twist the scriptures. Okay? Now, the Bible's got a lot to say about politics. You know what the Bible says about the future of this planet and the governments of this planet? It says they're going to be screwed up until Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom. And the only hope for the, for the governmental, economic, social, political, and ecological uh, salvation of this planet is the, set, is the kingdom that Jesus Christ will set up on this earth when he returns. Now, how about that for a political statement? Till then, do the best you can, you're going to lose. You know, people say, you believe in putting politics? That's not politics, that's Bible. See? Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive them and heal their land. And you hear that, you hear that belched out all over, don't you? You hear good, godly, concerned Christians quoting that verse like it's going to do any good. You know, they've been doing that for 200 years and hadn't done any good yet, has it? No. Did you ever notice what it says? If my people which are called by my name, who's he talking to? Well, if you go back to verse 12, the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself. You know what place that is? That's the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not in the United States of America. It's not in Europe. It's not in Asia. Jerusalem is in, well, you know where it's at. It's in Israel. You say, well, but did he really mean, you know, if he didn't really mean it, why didn't he say what he meant? If he didn't mean Jerusalem, every map you've ever seen, Jerusalem's in the Middle East. It's in Israel. Who did he say that to? It's important to know who he said it to. Or you're going to wind up in total confusion. By the way, Ephesians chapter 1, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Who did he say that to? He didn't say that to these people who are trying to get their land healed. He said that to members of the body of Christ. It's important to notice to whom he said, and it's also important to notice when it was said. Because if you don't, if you don't follow when it was said, you might wind up in a mess. Come with me to Exodus chapter 35. Here's a verse I, I, I love. I, I was born and raised in Alabama. And all my life, back in the, in the 60s and the 70s, I used to hear people say, well, you know, preacher, we've got to get out at 12 because the roast is burning and we've got lunch cooking. But they also call Sunday the Christian Sabbath. Well, listen, listen here. Exodus 35. Moses gathered all the, children of Israel, all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord hath has commanded, that ye should do them. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall, be, uh, it, it, there shall be to you a holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. You know what happens if you work on, on the Sabbath day? You're to be put to death. Now that's, kind of, that's more serious than cutting, the gra cutting your grass on Sunday. That's if you worked on the Sabbath day, you're to be executed. Now watch the next verse. Exodus 35, 3. 
You shall kindle no fire throughout your habitation upon the Sabbath day. You know what? You can't even go, Mama, you can't even go to the kitchen and light the stove. Fella, you can't go to the microwave and punch up the 90 seconds and heat your coffee or your instant grits. No work, and if you kindle a fire, you're dead meat. See, it's cheap to talk about keeping the Sabbath. It didn't, it didn't quite so wonderful when you get these regulations back here and you read them. You say, but what do you do with that? Hey, if you, would re if you don't recognize that that's written to Israel, by, it's written by Moses to Israel in time passed under the law, well, you'd have a problem. You see, folks, if you can't, if you can't understand these, these, these simple little questions, you're going to wind up with absolute confusion in your Bible study. You start out studying your Bible, ask yourself, who wrote it? Who did he write it to? And when did he write it? What's the context of the timing involved? Now, in connection with those three golden keys, there are three guiding principles that you need to have when you're reading the Bible. Come with me to Nehemiah chapter number 8. There are three guiding principles. First of all, when you study the Bible... You want to follow the literal principle. If the, if, the, if, the, if the normal sense of a passage makes sense, then you don't need to seek any other sense. Do the Bible the favor of reading it like you read any other piece of literature that you read, anything you write or that you read. Don't go off on some hypnotic, superstitious journey of trying to find some hidden, secret, covert meaning with some code involved. You don't need any secret codes. Just, re just give the Bible the literal meaning that common sense tells you. Nehemiah chapter 8, they found the book. They lost the book. They found the book. Verse 8, it says, Nehemiah's reading it to them. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. You see, they just gave it the normal understanding. We call that the literal method of, of studying the Bible, literal interpretation. You just give it the normal meaning. Come with me to Luke chapter 1. Let me show you where this is, can be important. In Luke chapter 1, verse number 30 to 33, here's a passage that it could be very important with. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou art conceived in thy womb, or thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign forever. I'm sorry, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now, when you read that passage, and I had a professor one time tell me, he says, Well, Brother Rick, Verse 32, when he says that he'll reign over the throne of his father David and he shall reign over the house of Jacob, that that's figurative. That we're the throne of David and we're the house of Jacob. Now, I don't know what genealogy you follow. Get on the internet and trace your, your heritage, but it ain't going to go back to David, dollars against donut holes. And it's not going to go back to Jacob, dollars against donut holes. Mine sure doesn't, and that professor's didn't. But he says, well, that we, we spiritualize that. We understand that Israel really means the body of Christ, the church, and, and David really means Christ. And You see, every major denomination in Protestantism, all of the Catholic seminaries you can ever find, all of the schools associated with them, spiritualize that passage and say David doesn't mean David, Jerusalem doesn't mean Jerusalem, the throne of David doesn't mean the throne of David, literally. It's all spiritual. But look, if that's, if that's to be spiritualized, then what about verse 32, verse 31, conceive in thy womb as you bring forth a son, and verse 35, when it talks about the virgin conceiving. If one part of the verse is not to be taken literally, why would you take the other part, the virgin birth, literally? That's why people don't take the virgin birth literally in a lot of the places I just mentioned. 
You see, that passage ha has a sense. It makes sense if you, let it, if you just give it the sense that it makes. Now come with me to John chapter number 1. You don't, need to, you don't need to be spiritualizing those passages. They make sense just like they are. House of David means house of David. Why? That's just what it means in the Bible. Now here's one, John 1, 29. The next day John, that's John the Baptist, seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now when he said the Lamb of God, pointing to Jesus, was Jesus a four-legged, with wool on his back? No, he wasn't a four-legged lamb. wasn't a four-legged animal. He was a man standing there, the God-man. But John says he's the Lamb of God. Well, wait a minute. That's what we call a figure of speech. That's a metaphor. He uses a, a figure, the Lamb of God, to describe the function and work of the person of Jesus Christ. This person who's standing there is going to be, he's going to function as... The Lamb of God. And that's a metaphor. Now when you read that verse, you know that's what it is. You see, the common sense reading of that verse tells you it's a, it's a metaphor. So in one sense you take it literally, it's literally a metaphor. Why? Because common sense tells you that. In Revelation chapter 1, he talks about the stars. Verse 20, he says the stars are angels. Daniel chapter 7, he gives you all those beasts. Then he says the four beasts are angels kings which shall arise. Well, see, when he takes the metaphor and interprets it, the interpretation is literal of the metaphor. You just read the Bible with common sense. That's what I'm saying to you. The second thing is you compare Scripture with Scripture. The Scripture is its own best interpreter. When you've got a verse over here and you don't understand it, look for another verse over there. Second Peter chapter 1, it says, no scriptures of any private interpretation. That doesn't mean you can't in interpret and understand it. It means you don't take one scripture, take it out of its context, and the issue here is going to be context. And a, context, a text without a context is a pretext. And the context of the scripture is going to be other scripture. Either the near context or the remote context, but it's going to be God's word that makes the interpretation for you. You take, for example, Matthew 24, verse 13. In Matthew 24, 13, Jesus Christ says, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Now, somebody comes along, quotes that verse to you, takes it out of its context. What's its context? Well, the next verse, he talks about the preaching of the kingdom of, of, of heaven, extending to the ends of the world. And the next verse, Matthew 24, verse 15, he talks about when you see the abomination spoken of by Daniel, Stand in the holy place. What's that? That's the middle of the seventh week of Daniel. Then he goes on down to verse 22 and he says, if, if these days aren't short, no flesh shall be saved. So in the context of he that endureth to the end shall be saved, the end is the end of the seventh week of Daniel and the salvation is a physical salvation. If you read the context, the verse makes sense. But if you take it out of the context, you don't compare it with the other verses, you'll never get it. But if you do, it makes Bible study exciting. The third principle is the principle of dispensational Bible study. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that one brings me to distinguishing the things that God has made different in his scripture. That's what this is. So the way you read your Bible, to understand it, when you come to a passage you ask who's talking, to whom are they talking, when do they say it, you read the passage literally, honoring and recognizing the metaphors, figures of speech, but read it just in the normal sense of the way. You compare, you look in the context, the near context, the remote context, you look for the explanation in the scripture itself, comparing scripture with scripture, and then you study the Bible dispensationally. That brings me to the issue of the secret. You got the student, the scripture, the study, and the secret. When I say secret, I'm not talking about some code you have to find hidden in the Scripture. I'm talking about what we talk to you about all the time. There's a, the basic division in your Bible is between what the Bible calls prophecy and the mystery, the secret. Acts 3.21, Peter says that he's speaking about that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. 
Paul says he's preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. There isn't any way that you can't understand that that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began, and that which is kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, there isn't any way you can miss the fact that those two things are different. You might not like it. You might choke on it. You might say, I don't want it. But there it is. And that is the fundamental, unavoidable secret to, Bible, to understand in the Bible. When you have God the Holy Spirit as your teacher, he'll take his words that he wrote on the pages in the Bible, preserve them for you. You'll take a King James Bible. You'll ask, who said it? Who did he say it to? When did he say it? You'll read it literally. You'll compare verses in your Bible. And then you'll recognize the disp dispensational distinction between prophecy and mystery. And when you do that, you'll be able to get a grasp on God's word that is unshakable. Without dispensational Bible study, the Bible is a confusing, hopeless hodgepodge, and it's like going to a smorgasbord. When you're right to divide it, you get a grasp of it. Now next time, in our next study, we're going to begin to take apart how you do this, how you study it rightly divided. You can understand God's Word for yourself. And when you do, you have the most exciting thing in the world happens because the Word of God works effectually in you that believe. It all starts with having God the Holy Spirit as your teacher. That starts when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Rely exclusively on Him as the Savior He died and rose again to be. And when you trust Him and nothing else to be your Savior, God then, the Holy Spirit, comes and moves in and brings you His life. Thanks for being with us today. Till next time. Fair enough.